Hi everyone and welcome to another episode in this Minecraft 8-bit computer series. In this video, we'll look at how we can extend our SR latch to make a data flip-flop for the registers of our computer processor. Before we look at data flip-flops, I'll briefly explain what registers are. In a computer processor, we have two sources of information, the inputs and the memory. The memory is used as storage space for both the program and any intermediary information that the program needs, such as partial sums or sections of an image. However, the processor can't work with the values in memory directly. Well, not in a simple processor like ours anyway. So the processor must retrieve some values from memory and put them into some fast, temporary storage. It can then work with those values, adding, subtracting, etc. When it's done processing them, it can put the results back into memory or output them from the system. Registers are this temporary storage inside the processor. Registers are also used to track information, like how far through the program we are. This is known as the program counter, or sometimes the instruction pointer. It tells the processor where it currently is in the list of instructions that make up our program. So now we know what registers are for, we need to know how to make them. First, we'll look at how we can extend our clocked SR latch into a clocked data latch. And then we'll extend that into a data flip-flop. And then finally, we'll combine multiple data flip-flops to build the 8-bit registers that we need. A data latch is a small step on from an SR latch. Instead of three signals coming in, it has only two, the data value to be stored and the clock. Whenever the clock is high, the value on the data input is stored into the latch. When we look at an SR latch, we notice that the S and R signals are always the opposite of each other, or they're both off. We can exploit this in a data latch by splitting our data input into two signals, one for set and the opposite for the reset. That's our data latch. Next, we want to build a D-type flip-flop, a data flip-flop. You'll often hear people talk about latches and flip-flops, and they can get mixed up. A latch is a memory element which changes state based on the level of a control signal. For an SR latch, it changes state based on the level, the on-off state, of the S and R control signals. For a D latch, the state changes based on the level of the clock input. A flip-flop, on the other hand, is a memory element which changes state based on the change in level of a control signal. We say flip-flops are edge-triggered. A rising or positive edge is when the signal goes from low to high. A falling or negative edge is when the signal goes from high to low. The state of a flip-flop changes when one or both edges of a control signal is seen. For a data flip-flop, we normally make the values stored by the flip-flop change to the data input when the clock rises or falls, but not usually both. It is usually important that all flip-flops in a system, or a large part of a system, change on the same edge of the clock. A flip-flop's input can change many times while the clock remains the same. The data input just has to be stable, i.e. ready to be saved, when the clock edge comes along. This means we can use ripple carry adder circuits, like the one we already designed, where the outputs may change multiple times during a clock cycle, and at different times. So long as the outputs are stable and correct, by the time the clock edge comes along, everything will be okay. Even in real circuits, it is the time taken for combinational circuits like adders to stabilize, i.e. for their outputs to be ready, that determines how fast the clock can go. This is actually partly where modern overclocking comes from. Engineers make slightly conservative estimates of how fast their combinational circuits are going to be to ensure the system always works correctly. When we overclock a processor, we are removing that margin for error, pushing the circuits to the limit of how quickly the clock edge comes around and the new state of the registers is saved. We can build a D flip-flop by putting two D-type latches in sequence on opposite clock levels. We can see that the first D latch saves the value when the clock is low. When the clock transitions to high, the value is saved and passed to the next latch. Now that the clock is high, the first latch won't change value, 
but the second latch will. So the output of the first latch is fixed, and the output of the second latch updates to match. When the clock falls from high to low, the opposite occurs. The second latch now saves its value, thus keeping the output of the flip-flop constant, and the first latch is now able to take the new value coming from the data input. Flip-flops like this also prevent another tricky problem in circuit design. Imagine we connected an adder's output to its B input and a non-zero value to its A input, say a value of 1. What should the state of the wires be? Well, it would be constantly changing. The circuit is completely unstable. In fact, in real electronics, this wouldn't just be broken, it could potentially be dangerous and possibly cause components to burn. A flip-flop stops this loop from occurring because there is a barrier between the inputs and the outputs. The input to the adder will only update when the clock changes edge, and the new output from the adder goes into the input of the flip-flop, which as we've seen won't affect the output until the next rising clock edge. So a flip-flop allows us to keep control of the flow of information within our system. Our D-type flip-flop isn't quite ready yet though. We also need to be able to clear the state of the flip-flop so that we can be sure it doesn't contain some bad values. We might also want to control on which clock edges the flip-flop takes a new value. In other words, we might want to enable or disable the clock input to the flip-flop. We'll quickly add an enable signal by anding the clock with the enable input. And we can add a clear signal by putting some OR gates into our circuit. You'll sometimes hear people talk about clear and reset signals. The convention I was taught is that reset is a synchronous set to zero of a flip-flop, and that clear is an asynchronous set to zero of a flip-flop. You can remember this by the fact that reset contains an S and clear contains an A. Synchronous means the flip-flop is set to zero only when the clock is toggled. Asynchronous means the flip-flop is set to zero whenever the clear signal is high regardless of the state of the clock. Here I've shown one way to make a clear signal rather than a reset signal. We can now make our 8-bit register by combining eight single-bit D-type flip-flops. The last thing for this video is to look at how the registers and our existing arithmetic unit fit together. For our processor, we'll have four registers. The A and B registers will be for any temporary values the program needs. The PC register will be for the program counter. And the O register, the operand register, will be for small values from the instructions, such as numbers to add together or other places to move in the program's instruction list. We'll need to be able to select two of these four values for the left and right inputs to our arithmetic unit. We can do this using multiplexers. In this case, we need four to one multiplexers. These select one item out of four possible inputs based on a 2-bit control signal. Here's what this looks like in module sim. Notice that the modules available to us are 4-bit D-type latches the clock module in module sim provides two level-based clock outputs, two separate phases. Just as we did before, we can build an edge-triggered D-type flip-flop by putting two D-type latches in a row on opposite levels. In addition, we want 8-bit registers, so we need to place two 4-bit registers side by side. The control inputs for the registers in module sim are similar to our logi sim design. In order to control the enable signal independently of the clear and clock signals, we use the split merge module, which is really just some wiring that allows us to mix and match different bits from different wires.
We also have some extra circuitry around our operand register. This allows us to move the low bits of the operand register into the high bits. We'll see in a later episode what this is for. To round off this design video, let's look at how we can build a 41 multiplexer using NOR gates and also using Minecraft optimized logic. Our first attempt uses AND and OR gates. We decode our two-bit selector signal into four wires. These indicate which of the four inputs we want to select. Then we AND these indicator wires with their respective inputs. This produces four outputs, only one of which will be active at a time. If the selected input bit is zero, all the outputs will be zero, regardless of the other inputs. If the selected input is a one, only the selected output will be a one. By oring together the output wires, we can produce our final single output that passes through the selected input and only the selected input. We now need to convert this design into NOR gates. This is straightforward, as we know how to build AND and OR gates from NOR gates. We can also eliminate any sequential NOT gates, as they aren't needed. Finally, we recognize that Minecraft can actually support OR gates and multi-input OR gates, as we'll see tonight, so we can further optimize our circuit for Minecraft. That's it for this design video. Please join in the live stream tonight to learn how we can build registers and multiplexers in Minecraft. I'll also be answering your questions in the live comments. See you later!